Hi, my name is Ben Pike. I am making this video as an attempt to just like clear everything. Like, I've been going through so much shit recently. And a lot of how bad I've been feeling has come down to like feelings of, like I can't do this or I can't talk about this. Or like there's certain things like you can't talk about. Or feelings like if, if I if I say certain things, everyone's going to judge me and I'm gonna get a stigma and then I'm I'm fucked forever. Or if I say certain things, I'm going to, you know, lose certain feelings of motivation that I've been building up for a long time. And it's I'm gonna go back on all that progress. So there's there's all of this stuff that's like guilt for just talking about how I am and feelings of like you can't say certain things, you can't put yourself saying certain things on the internet because then, you know, you'll, people, employers will look at it and you know, you're not going to get as much work and, but you have to be honest about how you feel and these are just insecurities and, um, and you can't feel this afraid of, of saying certain things. So I'm, I'm just going to say everything in this video. I'm just going to say absolutely, absolutely everything. Um, I'm not going to censor myself anymore. So this is what's going on. So my name is Ben Pike. I'm 33 years old. I live in Los Angeles, California, and it's uh, it's about since September 2020, the worst year ever for everyone, and this is my story. So I'm 33 right now. I turned 33 in July, and for since I was 19, so for the past 12 or 13 years, I have been dealing with a disorder psychologically that's like schizophrenia, but not really schizophrenia. Something similar to schizophrenia, but not schizophrenia. And this thing is, it just cut off and I had to redo it, another take. I have psychological problems and a big symptom of those is it's really difficult for me to even like create stuff like this that, that looks professional. Like people are probably going to criticize the lighting here and it's really, as one of my symptoms is it's so hard to to present myself in, a, in like a clean way so it's really hard for me to do things like get the lighting perfect for videos like this I probably shouldn't film it in my car with the I should have like a professional background but doing all of that is so hard and I wear clothes and a lot of times my clothes have small smudges of dirt or food on them and people who are healthy don't like they they take for granted their ability to like like present themselves in a perfectly clean way and one of my symptoms of this is, is not, and things happen, that's like, like how the, the video just cut out, and I'm going to have to recut this with something else. But, so, picking up where I left off, 12 years ago, schizophrenia, but not schizophrenia, because schizophrenia is a disorder where you think in a bad, in a, in a problematic way, and you hear voices, and you see people from not, that are not there. It's why you see on the street people talking to people who aren't there. That's schizophrenia. Now, what I have is similar but, but kind of different because I don't see people that aren't there, that aren't there. I do hear negative voices from time to time, but I do not see people who aren't there. But instead of seeing people who aren't there, I see this kind of constant hallucination on everything. Like an Instagram filter, but applied to everything. So everything kind of looks a little reddish colored red. Everything looks kind of twisted and scary looking. 
and I'm aware of this, that everything is looking, for me, distorted. It doesn't look the same to everyone, and, and everything kind of looks twisted, and, and as if like an atom bomb blew off, or I guess like an Instagram filter, if there was an Instagram filter of an atomic bomb blowing off, that's how everything looks. I've been dealing with this for 12 years. It's so frustrating because it doesn't ever get better, and it's like I'm living inside a constant like LSD hallucination that lasts forever. So, I've been dealing with this for 12 years. This is the first thing. The next thing is about five years ago, I, and I've made other videos about this on my channel, I was diagnosed with one of the rarest forms of cancer that exist. It's, uh, the cancer I had was lymphoma, and that itself is not very rare. A lot, like, lymphoma is a large percentage of people who have cancer have lymphoma. But the exact kind of lymphoma that I have is, was so rare that only 300 people in the United States have it at any one point. It's called gray zone lymphoma. And it's that, it literally is that rare that only 300 people in the whole country have it at, at any one point. So <clears throat> I had chemotherapy. I almost died. Um, I had chemotherapy when it was like stage four. And it was like the most intense chemotherapy program that you can even be on. Because to treat lymphoma like this, you just have chemotherapy, you don't have radiation or surgery, which are other ways to treat cancer. So because of that, that it's only chemotherapy and nothing else, it's one of the strongest chemotherapy regimens you can possibly be put on, where, um, where I had a pouch that I'd carry around for about three or four days, inside, like a fanny pack, and inside the fanny pack was a bag with three chemotherapy medicines that was then connected through a catheter into my neck and that was going in to my body over the course of three to four days straight and this is different from most chemotherapy other other chemo like how most people have chemotherapy is you go into the the clinic for like half an hour to an hour as you get the drugs put into you over that time it doesn't happen where you have a pouch that you take home and the medicine's constantly going in over like a certain three-day period. That's only for this and maybe one or two other chemotherapy regimens. But because of that, as you can imagine, it's the strongest. You get the strongest feelings, the strongest uh, side effects. I was also, as part of the regimen, put on a pill that I took called prednisone. And prednisone is a steroid and it has very extremely intense side effects which are worse for me because i have already have mental health problems so it it's so i was so angry and the dose in this regimen was was a ridiculously high dose like if you look up even chemotherapy regimens usually it's like 60 milligrams you take every day i was taking like 250 of this and i was so angry it made me feel so angry and like i'm going nuts and again because i have mental health problems it was all compounded and I even asked my doctor if there's any way they could reduce it, and he said, no, it's part of the program, there's, no, there's nothing they can do. So, to sum up so far, for the past 13 years I've been dealing with schizophrenia, but one of the like rarest kinds of schizophrenia. For the past six, five or six years, I, I was diagnosed with one of the rarest types of cancer that exists on the planet. So this is the summary of these of these things so far. Um, it's just crazy. Uh, now, it's just crazy. This, I mean, that enough, dealing with two of these things in my 20s on top of everything else is just, was just crazy enough on its own. Just totally, totally crazy. Now, on top of this, there are some other things that have been happening. For the past five or six years, 
around the time when I got canceled before, I've been on and off dating a girl named Francesca who is beautiful and lovely and she helped me through the cancer. She helped me through the whole thing in this very lovely, beautiful way. She's a very just like, some women are superficially beautiful, which is fine, but some women have like this deep inner beauty to her. And that's how I feel about Francesca. She has this, this deep, deep, just like inner beauty and, and her, her whole aura is beautiful. And she's also British, so she has this amazingly beautiful and sexy accent that is just like amazing. And I actually, like I said, I have this thing like schizophrenia. I do hear voices in my head, and one of the things that I connect that I that I that I love about Francesca is I like I found that because of the voices thing, like I need to be hearing things that are nice. Like if I hear pleasant sounds, it makes my feelings these these thoughts better and less. And so the fact that Francesca has this beautiful accent it, it's it's it really is like helps me so much with my like schizophrenia like synth like thing and and I do love her and she's she just radiates beauty I feel like really bad though like which I really don't I should not be in this I kind of, kind of on and off relationship with her and now we're living together and I feel like I should not be in this situation because it leads her on. I mean, I know I shouldn't be, it's pretty shitty. The reason why I'm in this is I have like intense fears of abandonment and I know this about myself. Um, and like I said, also that I do love her. I mean, she, she's, she's a lovely person. She helped me with the cancer, but that's not the only reason why I love her. I've, I've, I love her for, for the stuff I was saying before. and. It's just a really fucked up situation where I have to like go, I, I, I know the solutions, I have to go against my feelings, and I have to... Anyway, you get it. So that's the third thing, this kind of situation with, with Francesca. Um, so, the schizophrenia, rarest, like a form that like nobody has. Um, cancer, a form that nobody has. This relationship with my ex-girlfriend that I guess also like nobody has, it's really weird. And it's probably just my fault that I'm, I need to break up with her arm being a total prick, which is probably true. <sighs> On top of all of this, what I'm dealing with, like everybody else is COVID, so it's everything compounded. I don't have any money. I'm getting like, no, I haven't received my unemployment yet. I'm getting, I have like no money, so. I have to be out working and I'm driving for Postmates because of that, but even still, like, I I should be able to self-isolate and I can't because I can't afford it. Also, because I've had cancer in the past, yes, I've been in complete remission, but that's an underlying health issue, so I should not be out doing Postmates, you know, knocking on random people's doors, touching knobs, touching elevator buttons, all of that stuff I should not be doing, but I'm forced to because I'm broke. So like everyone else right now, the fact that it just, COVID just co compounds everything and makes everything worse. Um, so there's that. The other thing is my grandmother is about to die. Not from COVID, from um, she's just, she's very old. She has an infection. She's 94 years old. So, you know, she's, she's getting up there. Um, but she still could have lived a bunch more years, I feel. She is such a lovely, caring person as well. She's so, she's so beautiful for a long time. Because of my, like, before I was on certain medicines for my mental health stuff, I, I would just... I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make friends. I would cut out of my life everyone, including people who love me, like my grandmother. And when I spoke with my grandmother recently, the first thing I said was that I said, I said, I'm so sorry for not talking to you. 
um, for a while, and I was such an asshole. And I'm so sorry I have, like, depression, and make because of that I do stuff like this. And she is so beautiful and caring and empathic. The first thing she said was, she said, she said was, we know. And we, because it's not just her, but my, my family on my dad's side, she said, she said, she said, we know, and it's okay, and you're my grandson, and I love you, and, like, how amazing and beautiful do you have to be to say something like that? So I visited her a bunch of times. She's in a hospice. And the other day I was there, and I was so upset with myself because she's in this hospice, but it's in like the ghetto of the valley in Los Angeles, and she's in a room with one other person, and it's like this, almost like a broken down building. The conditions are so bad, but with hospices, it's like you can, you either pay the, a minimal price for something like this, or you have to have like 10,000 a month and go to like a better location. But I felt so bad because I felt like this woman does not deserve to be in this place. She's 94 years old. She lived through World War II. She raised four children with her husband in the in the 50s and 60s. This woman is an absolute champion and she's she this is where she's going to die in this place and I got so mad at myself that I I don't have more money so I couldn't afford to put her somewhere better. And, you know, they say money doesn't buy happiness, but in this case, like, like, <laughs> I feel like that, that, that saying is totally thrown out the window. Um, so, that's something else I've been dealing with. It's too much, you know. Recently, I've called suicide hotlines a bunch of times. And for the first time in my life, what I felt is like, I've had suicidal thoughts before, but for the first time in my life, what I felt is that I would potentially make some kind of a plan about it. Because it's just too much. It's all of this shit um, and then COVID, and so I've called suicide hotlines a bunch of times, and, um, and they help. They help. Um, the other, this is another thing that happened. The other day, I, and I'm going to preface this by saying, this thing actually wasn't traumatic for me, but I have to talk about it in order to then explain the, the things that happen afterwards that are, that do feel borderline traumatic. But the actual thing I'm about to talk about, I don't feel traumatized by, and it's a good thing. So what happened was I was assaulted by a random stranger on the street about two weeks ago. Um, I was walking north on La Brea in Hollywood and this guy comes up to me, starts walking with me. Out of nowhere, he comes up to me and starts hurling like the most vicious, nasty insults that you possibly can to another person. Just hurling them. He's saying, you're disgusting. You're a disgusting person. You know, you have dirt on your clothes which is disgusting. Like I said earlier, that I, I do have that because of the fact it, it does have to do a lot with my mental problems. Like it's really hard to like, you know, make sure that there's no dirt on my clothes at all. So anyway, so he's, he's saying you're disgusting. You have dirt on your clothes. You can't, he says you can't get in anywhere. Like you can't get into any groups and you can't have a, have a real job because you know, you're so disgusting. And he goes, you're a nice guy. And he goes, you can't win. You can't win in life. Now, this has happened before with crazy people. 
on the street, like I think it happens, it's, it's somewhat common in Los Angeles for this to happen to people, but every time this has happened in the past, they say a few insults and then you walk away and that's it. This time this guy was following me on my left in my personal space as he was insulting me. And this happened for about five minutes as I'm walking north in La Brea. He's right there on my left in my personal space, hurling the most vicious, nasty crap you possibly can. So I had to say something. I couldn't just ignore it because he's he's following me for five minutes, maybe even longer than that. So, the, so after like the fifth time that he said to me, I'm disgusting because of my clothes, I just very calmly looked at him I and he was wearing like a dirty hoodie and pants and I just very calmly said, come on, you can't say that. Like, look what you're wearing. And which is reacting, but I'm human. If someone's following me for five minutes, hurling insults, and I said it in a very calm way. And so Anyway, so he's following me, hurling these really intense insults at me. Another thing I said was, I just very, very calmly turned to him and said, sorry, this is really hard for me to talk about, that's why I was pausing. Like, I, when, I, when, when I said the thing about, look what you're wearing, I don't, I take back, I don't feel like I was reactive at all. I, that wasn't a reactive thing, that was just kind of like, you know, if someone's following you and keeping on saying stuff and they're not just stopping, you have to say something. So I don't feel like I was reactive there. But then I say some other just like very calm things. I say, um, you know, just like very calmly, you know, you can't talk to me like that. Things to de-escalate the situation. You can't talk to me like that. What makes you think you can talk to me like that? And things like that staying very calm he's continuing insulting me continuing insulting me it, it finally i just go peace and love brother peace and love then he says something like i'm gonna end you and then all of a sudden he starts punching me in my face the absolute hardest punches you possibly can into my face out of nowhere i fall down on the ground on la brea i say stop he comes over me and keeps punching me in the face over and over and over again then he walks away I get up I noticed I have a piece of my tooth in my hand I've chipped a tooth which I'm holding in my hand which is terrible but it's also terrible I haven't said this yet but I live in Los Angeles because I'm trying to you know I'm an actor and I'm pushing as hard as I can to be to be a working actor. So anything damage to your face, your teeth is a huge deal on top of that. And I see myself in a window reflection. I have the biggest black eye I've ever seen. I have scrapes on my shoulders. So I call 911. I follow him from a distance, which I have to do because I did not follow him. He would have just gotten away. The police come and the and after about 10 minutes on the phone with 911, the police show up. And he's still right there, and I point him out, and they arrest him. So, what I said earlier, I'm not, I don't feel like this was traumatic, because I feel like I handled the situation as perfectly as you possibly can. I wasn't reactive, I didn't fight back. I feel like everything was perfect about it. What's starting to traumatize me a little bit is the stuff that happened afterwards. So, anyway, I went to the hospital. They said that I had broken a bone in my eye and I had the chipped tooth and it's a huge, and I had a concussion also. So now I'm dealing with the lawyers and I'm dealing with the lawyers during coronavirus. And what happened is at the beginning of the month, there was a hearing, which I was, which I was told because coronavirus, I didn't need to be there, but to stay on my phone the whole day. And at the hearing was the DA. And based on the seriousness of the attack, the unprovoked nature, how it chipped my tooth, fucked up my appearance, the DA requested 18 months to two years in federal prison and three years probation. The defense said that he was gonna plea out and the defense argued that he has mental health issues, which is why he got angry. 
and that he doesn't have his priors. He has priors, but none of them are very intense to warrant a super long jail term. And the judge agreed, and he got one year in not prison, but county jail and three years probation. And I've just been so upset because of the fact that I wasn't even like, like the DA never contacted me beforehand. If the DA had contacted me, I could have said these things. I could have said what went on. I could have said that I have mental health issues. So this guy has mental health issues and he attacks people, but I have mental health issues too. Now mine manifest inward. So instead of taking out all my shit and other people all the time, I turn it within myself. What about my mental health issues? And I didn't get to say that because the DA never called me. And I've talked to a bunch of lawyers and they say it's fucked up that the DA never called me before the, before the hearing. So I could say things like this. And this is starting to mess with me because also I shouldn't be have to deal with all of this. I get fucked and I have to deal with all of this on top of it. I had to fight, I had to work three days to make sure that I'm, I'm gonna get a restitution hearing, and get restitution. I had to work for three days to get, to get the stuff together. I still haven't been able to find the police report. And then I talked to some lawyers and I said, you don't need the police report, just get the, just get the, the cover page. I was told that that's impossible for me to get also. I can't get that. And that I need because I have to check to see if this guy has assets. Because if he has assets, then I can sue him in civil court. But he doesn't, and, and then I can get a lawyer. But if he doesn't have any assets, I can't get a lawyer. So I haven't been able to get the information that even says that. So this is just stuff I've been dealing with. On top of everything else that I've said. See, this is now I'm thinking like what I said at the beginning of the video. I'm thinking like there's certain things you can't say, you can't put online. You can't be 100% honest. And I'm thinking like this stuff about the trial and the DA, it's going to, if people, someone finds this, it's going to fuck me over because I put it online. But at what point is, what's the difference between, you know, just censoring yourself, no, never expressing your full opinion, feeling totally closed off, not open, and you know, censoring yourself to the, like, certain things, like maybe not saying my, this thing about the assault and what happened because it could fuck with the, the money and the trial and put, like, like, where's the limit? Like, where's the amount that you open up and where's the amount that you just, like, delete off the internet and make sure you don't put online? Like, like, and how does somebody come to that limit without feeling completely repressed? Like, they don't, they, they hold everything in at the same time. How do you make these limitations, but still feel open in the world? I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. If I don't say stuff like this and, and, and be open, then I'm just closed off and then I'm weak. And like I said, I'm an actor and I feel like as an actor, any artist, if you're closed off, the art is terrible. So, you know, how do you do that? The first thing that came to my mind is that I need some kind of a mentor. Right, I need some kind of a mentor that I don't have. And like that's what that's the that's something that like a mentor could help me with. But I, I don't know. These just things happening after this assault are crazy. Oh, and this is the other thing about the assault that I've talked to. This is another thing which I was thinking I can't tell people. If I tell people this, it's gonna fuck all over my, my reputation permanently and I can't put stuff like this online. And that because this is something that I'm now that, that I feel like you can't tell people because people will, will judge you forever. But again, where's the limit? Where's the limit of the stuff that you don't say and the stuff that you say so that you feel open and exposed? Like, where, where, where's the line? Where's the line? So, I'm just gonna say this. It's gonna probably alienate a lot of people. But I've talked to some lawyers about this who who say that they think this, is a, this was a hate crime. That's why it was a random thing. It's a hate crime against a white person from a black person during this time of Black Lives Matter. So everyone's very riled up against white people and that this was a hate crime. The lawyer even who I, who, and I didn't even come up with this. Some lawyer told me this, that that's what, how, that's what she felt it was. And she said, you can't argue that in court. You can't tell people that you can't like, so like me saying this online is something you can't say, you can't do. and. I, I partially, myself, 
don't like that he even just said that because there's a lot of just dumb people who are racist who if I say something like this and this opinion gets popular it could actually increase like racism from from they could take what I say and, and it, it fuels the racism they already have so that's one reason why I feel even like I shouldn't say this and I'm not a racist I love black people I've had many black friends I'm an actor and I've been in acting classes with so many just incredibly impassioned creative beautiful people who were black and not just black but other races Asian uh, um, you know I don't know Eastern European Middle East like like I've worked with so many beautiful ethnic creative people um, and I'm definitely a left-wing liberal I grew up in Western Massachusetts so everyone is but I'm not like sometimes I just I hate liberals but the, the ones who are just so extreme and just kind of blind but the truth is I hate I hate extreme left people and extreme right people because they're just, it, they, the opinions are too blind um, the other thing that happened during this assault was that during the, or not the assault, but during the arrest, the police did have this guy down on the ground in a headlock similar to, to Floyd. And people were coming up to me and they were like, on this, as I had just been beaten up, my face is bloody, my tooth in my hand, everyone who passes is on there is on this guy's side everyone's like we have to make sure he doesn't do george floyd and this, this woman was even there next to me she was like i have to make sure that this situation is not going to escalate i have to make 100 percent sure about this and i turned to her i'm like oh my god this is so awful my face looks like this and she's like oh look this guy punched me in the face george floyd did not punch anyone in the face beforehand look at me look at my face look at my this the teeth in my hand like look at this you're being very disrespectful to me by, by being on this guy's side in this situation. Also, this guy was trying to fight the police, so they have to do something. There's a time and a place for stuff like that. And he was only on the ground for a minute tops like that before he was arrested. Completely different situation. But it's just really awful to get beaten the shit out of you. And then on top of it, people are like on this guy's side. People are still pissed off who are watching this are going, and you're such an asshole. How can you say it's a hate crime against a white person? How can you possibly say that? So, to sum up, I might forget some things. I get the schizophrenia-like thing that nobody else has when they're 19. When I'm 28, I get this cancer that nobody has. I have this situation with, with my, with my ex-girlfriend, Francesca, that 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 nobody has I get beaten up in this random way on the street which again a lot of people know that's never happened to before in this random way I don't even get to, the DA does not call me so I don't get to express my opinion and the guy the, the judge decreases the amount of time for the, the, the punishment for the assault without me even getting to say anything about it I can't find the face page. I can't even get get access to the information so I can find out maybe this guy isn't just like crazy um, and maybe he does have assets. I'm, I'm fighting much more with Francesca now. I, I, that's her name. That's my on and off again ex-girlfriend's name. I feel she's being manipulative. And just one step forward, two steps back, right? Um, I also can't cry. I want to cry, but I can't. I feel like I can't cry about any of this. 
I feel like I can't cry. And then, what I'm feeling, like I said, I'm, I'm an actor, that's why I'm in Los Angeles. Because of COVID, who's gonna wanna go to movie theaters anymore and sit next to random people? Who's gonna wanna go to plays anymore and sit next to random people? Even actors, who's, who's gonna wanna, what actors are gonna wanna work with other actors that they don't know when they're right up close to them? Or if you ever do like a love scene, obviously, and you're right, you know, who's gonna wanna do that anymore? Are there going to be movies? Are they going to make movies with people with their masks on? Like this? So they're going to make movies? They're going to make like love films with people with their masks on? <laughs> In conclusion, I had a revelation recently about myself where I realized that at the core, like really the only real problem that I have in my life at a core, and this is going to sound funny, but it's true, is that I'm a pussy. That's what I realized about myself recently. I'm a pussy. I come off in this really, really weak way around people. And it's because I'm a pussy. That's the reason why this random homeless guy attacked me, I think, if it wasn't a hate crime. Because you can just sense from me walking down the street that I'm a pussy. I think that actually that's why that I wear clothes that I, that I do with kind of dirt on them because I'm giving like kind of a vague idea of who, who I am through my clothes but it's not specific enough, it's not strong enough because I'm a pussy. And until that gets fixed, which it already is a little bit, I'm going to attract these kinds of negative reactions from people and negative situations and kind of confusing stuff that does not happen to people who have a healthy sense of self-esteem and who are braver than I am. And I get weird thoughts. Like, for example, how I just described this thing about being a pussy, I feel is different from this way that I have it written down in my apartment about it. And this way that I had, written, I had written down in my apartment about it is like the real thing. And I feel like I forgot what that is. And so I said some details about this that aren't true. And I feel like if I put this online, it's going to make me then go back on the, the truth of it. The thing I have written down that I can't remember right now. And um, that seems very weird. That's actually kind of like an OCD thing, which I think I also have. Um, It's just so much crap. It's so much crap on top of other crap, on top of other crap, on top of other crap. Like in the movie Jurassic Park, when they discover the Triceratops crap. It's like just that. It's like that pile of shit on top of another pile of Triceratops crap. 
It keeps compounding and keeps compounding and keeps compounding. Now, I'm never going to kill myself because even no matter how many thoughts I have, because I feel like that is the coward's way out. And I will never, ever, ever do that, ever. Although every time I hear a new story about some, you know, childhood icon of mine who's killed himself later in life, I start to get worried if that's going to be me. Like, after Robin Williams died, I was so worried about this. I was like, oh my god. So he fought this depression his whole life, and then he just kills himself it's in his 60s. And I'm like, is that going to happen to me? Wow, this video is almost 40 minutes. See, even this, like, you know, no one's going to watch a 40 minute video. I, I need to cut it more and make it more succinct and make it more whatever. And my mental health shit, it makes it so hard to do that. Or the fact that I'm a pussy. It makes it so hard to do that. So the impulse is just release this, even though it's a 40 minute video, and who the hell watches a 40 minute YouTube video? I don't watch that either, I would click away. The only people who get, who have 40 minute videos that have lots of likes and hits are the ones who clickbait. I'm also trying to remember if there's something else that I wanted to talk about here. I guess I'm just the type of guy who you either like love and fall in love with or I'm the type of guy who just pisses you off so much and you just want to punch in the face. Because I'm kind of a very black and white person so I attract black and white comments from people about me, opinions. I guess that's it. Sorry about all the jump cuts, but um, it's the only way I can think and do this. I can't just make a perfect uncut long video.